All right, everyone, it looks like we've gotten a, a decent amount of people joined by this point. So we'll go ahead and get started because we do have a full program today. My name is Christian and I'm part of the marketing team here at QIT. Thank you for being here and uh, welcome to today's webinar, which is entitled Get the Most Out of QIT, Best Practices and Inspiration for E-Commerce Success. A brief note on today's webinar, it will be recorded. So you can go back and review it later at your leisure or share with a colleague who might have missed it. For, in terms of questions, if you have any, we definitely welcome them. There, you should see a Q&A option on your toolbar uh, in Zoom. And uh, just feel free to put the questions in as we go along the presentation. We've set aside about 10 to 15 minutes at the end to review those with our experts. There'll be a couple polls throughout the webinar. Um, that you can participate in. And I'll join back in for the, to administer those polls just to keep things a little more engaging and get a sense of what you're most interested in. But for now, I'd like to start by introducing our two presenters for the day, Martin Pronk and Gary Symington, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Martin, would you like to take it away? Yes, thank you, Christian, and uh, welcome here. Uh, my name is Martin Prong. I'm the co-founder and CTO of uh, Qit, and is joining from uh, sunny Copenhagen um, from home, as uh, most of you probably also are. Um, and I've been working with uh, with e-commerce peak situations for the last uh, more than ten years now. Thank you, Martin, and hello, everyone. I am Gary Symington. Born and raised here, uh, pretty close to our Minneapolis office where I currently work. Uh, for those of you who aren't fil uh, familiar, Minnesota is just about the coldest state here in the U.S. So I grew up playing ice hockey, downhill skiing, all those fun winter activities are near and dear to my heart. Uh, so that's a little about me. But professionally here, I am the customer success manager. So I'm here to help with really anything any of you need regarding our solution, helping you get the most out of it, keeping you posted on new developments. Uh, making sure your feedback is heard, uh, all that type of stuff. I'm uh, really here to be a solid partner with you guys through anything you hope to do with our solution. So a quick agenda here. As you know from the invite, we'll be discussing best practices in regards to our solution. We'll be drilling down into three key areas being integration, implementation, and then administration of the queue. We will hear from a couple of our customers sharing some success stories. Uh, nice enough to join us today. Uh, so looking forward to that. And then as Christian mentioned, we will address some questions at the end. So we encourage you to drop those in the Q&A tab below throughout the presentation here. All right, thank you, Gary. And it's time for our first poll of the presentation today. So we wanted to get an idea of what topics you're especially interested in today. We know Gary just went over the, the agenda, but we're curious to, to hear what you're most keen to, to hear about. It will now pop up on your um, Zoom toolbar in one moment. So now you should see the options there, integration, implementation, administration, user experience, bot mitigation, or other. So I'll give everyone a couple of seconds to complete the answers. All right, so about five more seconds and then I'll end this poll. All right, so looks like the winner is bot mitigation. We do have a, a section on that towards the end of the presentation and one of our guest presenters will also be speaking to that. So that, that will definitely be covered and, and in coming in second place is uh, user experience and we have a nice dedicated section to that. And Live Glam, one of our other um, contributors guest uh, today will also be covering that. So definitely a lot to look forward there. And if you do have some other questions, again, just feel free to enter those into the Q&A section. 
uh, and we'll take them later. But for now, uh, Martin will start us off with the best way to integrate Qit in e-commerce. Martin? Thank you, Christian. Yeah, so let's dive into it. And um, the best way to integrate Qit into e-commerce. And um, historically, it's been around uh, using JavaScript because it's quick, it's easy, and it's been good enough in a lot of retail cases. But one of the things we see now is the trending of moving into adding server side or edge integrations. Um, so the best practice nowadays is on uh, having a combination of the JavaScript and the server side or edge integration. And when I'm talking about edge integration, it's uh, the new trend of where um, your CDN provider allows code to be executed at the edge of the, the CDN network. And it's, it's especially cost, uh, companies like Cloudflare and CloudFrom from Amazon, it's Akamai and, and Fastly is also moving in that direction. It's still pretty new, but it's definitely a trend we see moving forward. And, and we are of course following that trend very closely and as part of that. Um, so whenever I say edge integration, that's what I mean with that. Um, so if we uh, try and look into where should you then do this integration? And um, it's of course, uh, again, the best practice is to um, think about your use case. But by having this um, combination of client-side JavaScript and backend or edge and server connectors gives you the possibility to uh, now have Qt working in a combination of the static pages doing Ajax calls like an add to cart function. So you can now have a combination of um, more fine-grained uh, in integrating Qt on just the places where it makes sense. And where it makes sense, of course, depends on where you see the bottlenecks of the system. Um, traditionally, it's been like, okay, let's protect the entire website because then we know we're safe. But as the uh, CDN adoption is getting more and more common and the uh, usage of a single page app or SPA app where the, uh, a lot of the content is very static and is just uh, dynamically loaded through Ajax calls. The, um, the, the integration point of Qt can be moved into the precise place where you want it, whether it's the entire web shop as it has sometimes been, or just when somebody's adding an item to the cart, hitting the back end and therefore uh, adding, you know, hitting a potential bottleneck or you can move it all the way to the checkout. And it, again, it's of course, depending on what makes sense in, in your specific use case. Um, and if we try to dive into how this is done, because it's, it's a, a relatively new feature where here you have a, a, a typical web shop. And in, in this case here, this page is static. It's all served uh, from, from the CDI, CDN, but, um, we have injected uh, or inserted a new version of the Qt JavaScript into this one here. And if you notice at the top, there is a data, a data Qt intercept domain and a data Qt intercept that is set to true. These two flags indicates that um, this JavaScript needs to work together with a server side uh, implementation or an edge implementation. And the, the way it's working is that once the user comes to the page, um, the JavaScript is loaded and ready. And when a user is clicking the add to cart button, an Ajax call is hitting the backend. Um, and if there's a queue situation, the JavaScript will uh, pick up the response and send the user to the queue. Um, and once the user is through the queue, can come back and continue the user journey. So you don't need to have uh, the queue blocking the entire website. It can be delayed until the uh, desired point in time. Awesome, thank you very much for that, Martin. And now it's time for our second poll of the presentation. And if you are having some issues seeing the poll options, it might be because of an ad blocker. So if you're viewing this in the browser, 
and you have an ad blocker running, try to disable that uh, and see if that, that might help the poll show up appropriately. But we're going to be talking about some functionality that might be different depending on how you use QIP. So we want to get an idea of which use cases are present in the audience. So the next poll here is which use case best describes how you typically would use QIP. Uh, and you should now see the poll pop up and we'll give everyone some seconds to answer it. All right, we'll give everyone about 10 more seconds. All right, so it seems like uh, high traffic from marketing campaigns, for example, influencer campaigns is, uh, is the top uh, use case present and closely followed by the collection releases. And that fits very perfectly with our two guest contributors today. So there'll definitely be some interesting food for thought there and some best practices uh, that they'll speak to. So we'll keep things rolling along here. And next we will have Gary talking with us about the pre-queue. Gary, do you wanna take that away? Absolutely, thank you, Christian. And thank you all for your feedback on those polls. Uh, so yes, we will be moving on now to discuss the pre-queue feature and when it's best to make use of that. As you can see here, there's an example uh, pre-queue landing page and uh, we've really boiled down the two key uses for the pre-queue uh, to two elements, the first of which being technical. So we've seen that as you announce a specific start time for a popular event, however you may do that through marketing channels like social media or email, advertising, really any way you spread the news about an event that has a specific start time. Uh, we've noticed that users will show up prior to that start time and be hitting refresh or letting their friends know about the event, anything like that. And that can really culminate to a lot of stress on your servers before your event has even begun. So the pre-queue is really there from a technical standpoint to make sure that you're able to get off on the right foot and don't run into any hiccups right as your event is just getting going. And then the second element there is a user experience uh, feature or uh, aspect of the pre-queue. Uh, as you may know, fairness is a very key value here at Qit. So we've designed the pre-queue to be sure to randomize users as, it, as they're being collected prior to that event starting. And so you know they're all collected together, randomized, and then reintroduced into uh, the sale in that order to make sure that users who show up an hour before and users who show up on time don't have you know, differing levels of access to the sale. And kind of furthering that user experience uh, aspect of the pre-queue, it's always great to be able to communicate to your users that they're in the right place. The event starts, you know, as you can see here, in seven minutes, 33 seconds. Giving them that info prior to the event uh, goes a long way to boosting their experience. Thank you, Gary. And, um, um, no, you just go on, sorry. Yeah, no problem. I'm, I'm happy to uh, kind of expand on some best practices here. So um, as I mentioned, especially with those events where you have a designated start time, uh, we um, mandate that you run a pre-queue of at least five minutes just to make sure, like I said, that it's getting off on the right foot. Um, we've had user or customers run pre-queues anywhere from five minutes to several hours based on uh, your forecasting and specific goals for that event. But definitely, if you've spread the news, we would recommend putting that pre-queue on for at least five minutes. Yeah, and sorry for jumping the gun before, uh, Gary. Um, it's just that it, it leads nicely into the next topic about uh, bot protection, because uh, the pre-queue is actually one of the major elements of the bot protection features. We usually see bots attacking in, in two aspects one is speed and the other is volume and having this pre-queue running will pull up the speed angle completely because it doesn't matter that you are 
super fast at hitting the link when it's uh, available or that you have a, a super fast internet connection or anything, it, it, um, it puts humans and bots uh, alike from a speed angle. Um, so what's the best way to protect against bots? Yeah, one of them is using the, um, the, uh, the pre-queue. Um, and another aspect of this is that, uh, yeah, from, from a pair's point of view at least, then e-commerce is yeah, hit by, uh, by bots, um, but it's not as bad as other uh, industries. But when it comes to the big sales, when you have these uh, hype sneaker releases or other product launches, then at least according to Akamai's uh, threat research uh, department, then the um, amount of bots goes insanely up. And um, so it's, it's natural that it's uh, thinking about the use cases you just uh, highlight as the most important one, product uh, drops and influences uh, driving peak traffic then uh, bot usually follows um, just along the way. Um, so looking at some of the best practices, of course, uh, the, the, the first step is to make sure that you integrate with the server side or edge connector and not just relying on JavaScript. Uh, so if um, a bot is a, a, a real thing for you in, in your specific use case, then uh, definitely consider uh, that part of it. Um, but you can also leverage some of Hewitt's other bot protection features. And um, we, if we look at those, so these are more looking at the volume angle where the pre-queue handles the speed angle. This is uh, trying to, to limit the volume of the bots. And um, as the, the, the topic here is e-commerce and, and um, uh, it's a business to consumer uh, sale, then you have the option to make the request analysis features we have uh, more strict because the users will be scattered along a lot of different IP addresses. And uh, um, it's, it's safe to, to make it more uh, strict uh, in these use cases. Um, you can also require that the user is either solving a capture or a new feature that is launching here next week, a proof of work challenges before they're allowed to enter the queue. Um, the capture is the usual visual um, challenge that is uh, challenging humans. The proof of work challenge is challenging bots and it's non-visual. It's about making sure that if you come with a, 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 as a bot network, that then you need to pay some performance, some CPU cost for uh, going up in numbers. Um, and if you are in a business where users need to have a profile before they're able to shop on your website, um, then you can also uh, use the um, require unique key feature we have, which requires the user to identify themselves before they're even allowed to enter the queue. And finally, of course, we also have launched relatively newly a, a feature where you can block traffic from data centers. And again, speaking into the retail sector, it's rarely that you have normal users coming from a data center IP address. So you can either soft block them or you can hard block them all together. It's, it's all options of the bot and a few uh, protection features. So that was uh, the, the um, highlight on the bot and abuse protection. Excellent, thank you very much, Martin. It's great to see the interest from the poll in our bots and abuse feature, especially in light of the recent developments we've been making. So definitely some exciting things happening over there. And it was also great to see on the poll a lot of interest in user experience, which is what I'll really be touching on primarily here, uh, starting with what information should be shown on the queue page. So kind of an overview of the best practices that we'll be expanding on here shortly. Uh, you want to be guided by queue psychology, keeping that in mind, how people react to waiting in line and showing as much information as possible and making sure that that messaging is as clear as possible to make sure that your users aren't confused and they have a, a rich understanding of uh, what exactly is happening as they're waiting in the queue. Uh, we also highly recommend taking advantage of our real-time communication tool 
and using things like videos, games, other interactive widgets on that queue page to make sure that your customers are occupied and engaged as they are waiting to enter the sale. So delving a little deeper into queue psychology here, uh, it's essentially a theory that um, it's not necessarily the amount of time that someone is waiting in line that affects their experience, it's more so how they feel while they're waiting. So to expand on that a little bit, uh, I kind of like to make the analogy of waiting for an elevator. So you hit the elevator up button, but there's no indication of where uh, the elevator is or what floor it's currently on. That wait will feel a lot longer uh, than if you hit that elevator button and uh, there was an indication about the elevator, of what floor it was on, what direction it was heading in. You know, having that information present makes a wait uh, feel a lot less, even though the wait may be the same time in reality. So as you can see from these bullet points, uh, you really want to avoid unoccupied time, uncertain waits, unexplained waits, uh, any unfairness to any degree. And we've sort of boiled these uh, six points down to a simple equation of occupation plus communication equals reduced anxiety. So the more you are keeping your users occupied while they're waiting, the more you're communicating with them uh, with relevant information about the wait, the less stress they'll feel and the better overall experience they will have. So to further that uh, communication point, uh, you definitely want to be very clear in your explanation of the wait on the queue page. You can see in the example that the customer here uh, made it very clear that the queue is here to instate uh, fairness into their shopping experience, uh, facilitate a smooth uh, user uh, journey online through the buying experience, and uh, really just giving them a general explanation beyond you know, what you would see on an error page or any other um, know indication of what's happening you want to make sure that they know the queue is here for their own good and that it's here for the uh, betterment of their experience and to go further along that communication point would be to show all wait time information you can see in the uh, red square there there are several metrics that you're able to include on the queue page we would recommend as a bare minimum including that progress bar that you can see there in green with the uh, Q man walking across it. We've found that the uh, visual representation there of their standing in line goes a long way to give them context on their weight. And then we recommend even taking it a step further to include some of those number based metrics that you can see below. Um, you can actually toggle them on and off in the platform, which uh, enables you to customize what is shown. Again, we would you know, encourage showing as much as you're comfortable with. And uh, you can see the options there of you know, overall queue numbers, bottom line, estimated wait time, really anything you can provide to your customers to give them a sense of, of how long they'll be waiting. Real-time communication or dynamic messaging, as many of you know it, uh, is actually one of our more popular features according to many of our customers. So if you're not making use of it, I would definitely recommend checking that out as it's a great ace in the hole during your events as they're actually live to communicate directly with your customers. We've found that they enjoy it because it gives uh, something of a human touch to that waiting experience. Uh, getting a message directly from someone at the company makes them feel you know, heard and cared for. Um, and it's really, you know, as I mentioned, that ace in the hole for a number of uh, you know, reasons you would need to communicate directly. Whether you are experiencing some sort of issue, um, you can let them know about that. And especially in that top uh, word bubble there that you can see, it's great for communicating if a specific product size or design, color, whatever it may be, is out of stock. So that uh, not only users who are after that specific design are able to leave without needing to wait longer uh, without getting what they're after, but it also significantly decreases the wait time for users who are in line for uh, a product that is still available because those uh, whose product is unavailable have, have been left. And this feature, our email notifications, is one that many of you may not be taking advantage of currently. Uh, we definitely recommend it kind of going on the uh, topic of occupation during that wait time. Uh, it allows your users to uh, input their email address, as you see in that red box, click notify me by email, and uh, then they're able to step away from their session. They can go about their day, occupy their time with whatever they would have otherwise, 
Uh, they can even, you know, enter a queue at their office computer and then commute home and complete their purchase on their home computer. It uh, really just gives them that flexibility to spend their time as they would like as they're waiting to uh, enter the queue or enter the event from the queue. And uh, kind of going along that uh, occupation point further would be to spruce up the queue page a bit with some engaging uh, widgets. You can see that there are a couple videos on this example page. We've had customers get very creative with trivia games, other interactive pieces, uh, really anything you can think of. Uh, it's it's uh, highly beneficial to keep your customers occupied, but also to have a chance to communicate with customers and you know show them a new product that you're working on or convey information about an upcoming event, give them coupon codes to incentivize repeat business. Um, really anything you can think of would be excellent to put on here um, for a number of reasons, but especially to boost that customer experience. And uh, last kind of feature here on the Q page specifically, you'll want to include support uh, information for your company. Uh, we put a link called what is this on all the Q pages that your uh, users are able to click and it brings them to this page that has an explanation of what Q it is and how it functions. And so to go a step further there would be to add your support info to make sure that customers uh, who are uh, potentially unfamiliar with the Q, we found that many of our uh, you know, end users are familiar with the Q, but there's certainly a chunk who aren't. So making sure you cover your bases there by formatting a uh, support message on in the Go platform under account and company profile, as you can see on your screen there. And now I'll address the question of what do you do in the unfortunate event that your uh, website or app does start to get overloaded during the sale? The quick and easy answer here would be to pause the queue. So touching back on that communication point, you'll definitely want to be very clear on why the queue is being paused to make sure that customers aren't confused by uh, the lack of updating on those wait time metrics. But um, you know, pausing is great for really any reason, as we mentioned, uh, you know, if your servers are becoming overloaded, but also if you need to, to update inventory or really any uh, miscellaneous thing that can pop up internally that pause button is there as a fail safe for your team to make sure that you've got your ducks in a row. And we've made it very simple to pause an event from the Go platform. As you can see on the monitor page of a specific event, you can hit the pause button, just like you would on your TV remote at home. And that will bring up a window here. And as you can see, it uh, gives you an option of if you would like to write a message to users in queue, we highly recommend that you do to make sure that they're aware, as I mentioned. Uh, so you can put that uh, information in the text box there. And as you can see, uh, it's available in a variety of languages. We have uh, over 40 languages available for the queue page itself, as well as this uh, support information too. So we uh, are, are sure to support all of our global clients there. Great, thank you, Gary. And the last, uh, the last poll will be dealing with the next topic we'll we're gonna be discussing, which is about desktop queuing versus mobile queuing, especially when it comes to native apps. So we wanted to get an idea of how many of you have a native app where you might need to use the virtual waiting room. So the question here is more or less simple, yes or no. Do you offer a native app and the polling is now launched. Of course, depending on your role, you might not be aware. So feel free to enter insure, unsure if, if you are unsure. I'll give everyone about five more seconds here. All right, so about half of you have answered that you do have a native app. So there's some considerations here for Martin to you know, speak to in a second and about a third of you were unsure. So this is definitely something to take back to your colleagues who, uh, who, who would be the ones managing the native app for some things that they should just uh, think about if they are planning on using Qit with the native app. So Martin, do you wanna to speak to that? Yes, thank you, uh, Christian. Um, 
So um, what do you need to know about the difference when using mobile versus this desktop queuing? And um, first of all, let's take a brief look at what does it actually mean to have a native mobile app? Um, because you can you know, have it just a normal mobile browser and be on your mobile, going to the website and transact on that one. But you can also have the, um, the uh, progressive web app, which is basically an app that is just a browser wrapped in. Um, and then there's the final true native apps that are built for either iOS or Android. And uh, the, the trend we see is that uh, more and more clients are moving away from, from truly native apps into progressive web apps, um, or altogether just move, moving into mobile browsers. Um, when looking at the best practices on the integration, it's pretty much the same as doing a, a normal desktop integration. Um, if you have the development in-house, then it's usually a, you know a one or two days task to get uh, the the native app in. The most uh, the you know tricky part is that you need to get it through the app. Uh, stores uh, uh, approval, which adds latency to the uh, to the approval uh, and the entire development process. Um, another uh, thing to consider is that make sure that you can force update all the app users so that uh, you um, make sure that not just a few of them have the version with the queue integrated. Um, uh, because then it's kind of defeating the the purpose of it. Um, so, but looking at the time, I think we'll uh, move on. Yeah, absolutely. So that concludes our section of the presentation here. Uh, to make things a little bit more digestible, we have condensed the uh, topics and ideas we discussed down into this checklist here. Uh, in case you want to go back and reference what we discussed, this will be a pretty easy way to get those high level details. And now without further ado, I'm going to step out of the way here and let uh, one of our guest speakers, Alex from LiveGlam, share some of her ideas on delivering a seamless customer experience. Awesome, thank you so much. Hi everyone, like you said, my name is Alex and I'm the Director of Business Development and Operations at LiveGlam. I am coming to you from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania right now. Um, just a tiny bit of background on us. We are an e-commerce beauty subscription. We offer three different clubs um, and endless possibilities. Uh, we create and curate monthly products for every level of beauty lover. So, you know, as he mentioned, um, my focus today is delivering a seamless customer experience and just kind of giving you a little bit of background as to why we started working with Qit. Um, we mainly use Qit for our influencer-based beauty product launches. So whether it's a collaboration and that influencer took some time to go ahead and design their own collection, or if they're really just promoting something that we've curated internally, um, you know, there is, there is that element of some sort of influencer or affiliate promotion. Um, our web traffic, because of that, tends to spike very quickly, going from you know, a few hundred users on the site to tens of thousands, if not over 100,000 in a very short period of time. Um, as mentioned previously, you know, when you have those launch times, you know, 10 a.m. Thursday, people will get there early and line up. Um, so we really do have minimal room for error with traffic at that level. Um, as you can all imagine, you know, one tiny thing going wrong affecting hundreds of thousands of people really has some room for damage. Um, and because we are a recurring revenue model and a socially based brand, um, like I said, those negative in experiences can have a big impact even just beyond our own audience um, and customer base, especially given the fact that we have our affiliates and influencers involved, you know, we don't want that to affect how their, their audience might view them as well. So that's definitely very important to us. Um, so just a couple of examples, you know, as I mentioned, we do use pre-Q and Q. So this is an example of our pre-Q and kind of how we approach the customer communication, um, setting those expectations, all of that. So we definitely, we, we actually use the pre-Q for about four hours ahead of launch. 
Um, and I'll kind of get into a little bit more as to why we do that, um, mainly for testing purposes. Um, and you know, people do, do show up at 6 a.m. to try to get into our website and, and maybe grab this product early just in case. You know, um, So there's definitely a lot of excitement around these launches, which is another big reason um, that we wanna make sure that we reduce anxiety and really over communicate, um, which does begin well before the launch, um, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, and then we also use Q, you know, the regular safety net and all that good stuff. Um, and this is just kind of giving you a comparison of what those two um, things look like in addition to the previous examples. Um, so again, you know, the copy is very optimized. We have been using Q for over two years. So, um, you know, we wanna, we've gone through a series of lessons learned, um, you know, in general overall as a company, but especially with um, how we use Qit, how we use the pre q what language we're using. Um, so I know that someone had asked a question about that, which we'll get into during the Q&A, um, but we have spent a good amount of time optimizing the language using our brand voice, um, you know, what do we want to show in this bottom section here? Um, since there are so many options, we've really just tried to dial down what works for us best. Um, so going into some of the takeaways, which I've already touched on briefly, um, it's extremely important for us to set expectations with influencers and customers in advance. So not just on that pre-Q page, not just on that, you know, once they're in line. Um, we actually have a blog post, which is something that has worked really well for us. And that's available to access at all times for our customers. Um, so it basically kind of, it's basically, it basically tells them, you know, what, what happens? You're in line, what, what does this even mean? Um, and we let them know that well ahead of time. And we also ask that our influencers go ahead and let their customers know about that so that no one's shocked when they get to the website. Um, and we also, of course, want our influencers to know what to expect as well, since they'll be getting, you know, some people will tweet at them and say, you know, what is this? I'm on the Live Lamp site trying to get your product and there's a line, you know, what does that really mean? So trying to answer those questions well in advance has really served us um, and helped us reduce a lot of the anxiety uh, for those of you who are in fashion or beauty or whatever industry might kind of have these um, highly anticipated launches. There's definitely a lot of anxiety surrounding them. So we really want to bring that down, um, make sure it's very calm and expected environment. Um, which does kind of tie into the second point here about pre-Q. It does let us do one of the most valuable parts of these launches, which is testing on our live site ahead of the launch without disruption. So without those people trickling in at 6 a.m. trying to see if they can, you know, maybe get it early by a fluke or whatever it is, um, you know, this allows us to lock out that site, but in a branded way. So again, setting that expectation allowing our entire team to bypass the queue um, and get in there and actually test so that we know, you know, we of course test on our development server well in advance, um, but you know, we have to actually test in the real environment as well. So this allows us to do that without, again, those traffic spikes or people kind of trying to come in and, and see those assets and elements before we actually feel good about releasing them to the public. Um, so in addition to, you know, that setting those expectations ahead of time, it is amazing to be able to kind of toggle the communication um, in a branded way, in our brand copy, um, and again, to the influencer's preference as well. That's a big part of it. So we do really involve them um, in, you know, how we're presenting this, how we're explaining everything. It's got to be something that they're comfortable with, ultimately, since, you know, of course, like I said, it's their product, it's their audience. Um, and then in addition to kind of the lead up, making it seamless, we also want, you know, the actual checkout and conversion experience to be smooth as well. Um, so, you know, nothing worse than when you finally get onto the site and you finally get that product in your, in your cart and then the site crashes, um, which, you know, has happened to us well before our queue at days. Um, and, you know, especially with these high, you know, high anxiety launches, I guess, um, that can be really devastating. And again, that has a ripple effect that can come with some backlash. So making sure that people know once you're in there, you're going to have plenty of time to get what you need, proceed through checkout, double check your shipping, 
you know, there's no need to rush, there's no need to panic. And that's definitely something that we have addressed and kind of honed in over the last two years. Um, and then finally, you know, what makes this, you know, what makes all the difference um, is our comfort. And, you know, the QIT team has always made sure to offer fantastic support. Um, they made themselves available for all of our events, you know, I think we're a little, we're well beyond, you know, our early days of having a million questions as things are going live. But, you know, regardless, the team has always made themselves available. The back end is extremely user friendly. Um, you know, my developers can go in there, of course, and make their magic. But the fact that I can go in there and also know what I'm doing uh, is definitely a huge benefit, especially for some last minute changes. Um, it's, it's very user friendly. I, I can't say that enough. And uh, the team really has made all of the difference, kind of helping us grow, helping us understand bot security and all the stuff that we've gone through already in this presentation. Um, so all in all, it has been a fantastic experience that's continued to get better. I do feel like the QIT team and the LiveLAM team grow together um, and remain in communication, which is super, super important. Um, and yeah, so we actually, I just want to quickly mention, we are doing a launch on Thursday, June 4th, 10 a.m. PST, and we will be using Qit if anyone <laughs> would like to come over and see how everything goes. You know, hopefully everything goes smoothly, but at the very least, if something does go wrong, you know, we do have the opportunity to pause the queue, kind of regroup, and again, maintain that branded experience so people know, hang tight, don't worry, we'll be right back. Um, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it and um, feel free to contact me, but we will also be covering some questions at the end. Excellent. Thank you so much, Alex. That was great insight and it's always great to hear about the exciting things happening over at LiveGlam, especially uh, in regards to one of our key use cases there with those highly anticipated releases. Uh, so now we will give the floor to Pierre from COCA, who will be sharing some information on using Qubit as a tool for fairness. Thank you very much, uh, Gary, for this introduction. And thank you very much also, Alex, for presenting this very inspirational use case, the part where we have to manage the uh, expectation and the frustration of the user, and the part where the website crushes does ring a bell indeed. So firstly, let me introduce myself. My name is Pierre. I'm a developer here at COCA in Switzerland. So COCA is not the typical run-of-the-mill e-commerce website that you can see like Amazon, etc. We are not only very community-oriented, but also in our use case, we are only selling one offer a day. This means that this offer can be anything from electronics to sport gear, usually with a huge discount. That means for us, each sale is an event. A few times a year, we have very exclusive offers, very short with very, very limited inventory, where we're selling, for instance, electric cars or gold coins. And for those offers, we have more people that want to buy the offer than we have stocks. This is the reason why we're using Qit. Uh, that allows us to put in place a lottery in order to, for us to pick users from the queue at random in the fairer manner as possible by pausing and restarting the queue. In order to do that, we have implemented Qit in our native apps and in our backend servers before the checkout. This means that the user clicks on the add to bags button and then is redirected to the Qit page. This approach allows us not only to use the amazing bot protection system, but also to log the user and thus use the unqueue token in order to ensure fairness and clarity in the process. Uh, finally, as you can see on the, on the screenshot on the screen, you ha we have customized the pre-queue and the queue page quite heavily. This means for us, it's really, really important to engage with the user, not only on why there is a queue, but also what are the rules and uh, how our use case is, is actually working. And this means that we, have, we know that we create a lot of frustration when we put a queue in place. And for us, being able to engage and communicate with the user is really, really important, especially when the users have not, been, uh, have not won this lottery. And therefore, we have to be as clear as possible. So a few takeaways for us is first, we are using the server side integration quite heavily in order to allow the authentication and to prevent cheating. First, cheating is not 
only people trying to open the tab and the queue, uh, the queue, sorry, in the multiple tabs, but also we had like bots and people actually writing exploits to be able to bypass the queue. So for us, all those bot protections and uh, fairness feature are really, really important to our process. Also, considering that the, uh, those events are quite, are happening quite often, in the year, the integration to Qit is something that's part of not only our business processes, but also our product. This means that all the native apps have the Qit SDK embedded. And for us, enabling a queue is not only uh, deploying some code, but just it boils down to uh, business processes. Uh, our business team can at any time start a queue, um, flag an offer as we need a queue for this one, and is really hands off as far as development is concerned. For us, it's actually really important to have a, a tool like that because if at first we were using Qit to uh, manage the traffic, now we're really using it to handle this very critical queue section and lottery section for us, although we can manage the traffic because the people are able to go on our website to browse the offer, to log in and to uh, interact with our customers, uh, customer service, stuff like that. It's also very nice for us to be able to control how many people go out of the queue, considering that for us, optimizing the checkout process, it's a bit more complicated than uh, static pages like the offer page. Okay, thank you very much. So that's pretty much the use case that we have here at Coca. We are actually really happy to work with Qit. Uh, we have participated in the development of some of the backend uh, server libraries with the technical Qit team. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to be able to show this a bit innovative use case that we have. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Pierre. That insight is, is very valuable, especially uh, relating to that very cool and unique use case you guys have with those uh, daily deals. I'll have to check some of those out myself here. Um, but yeah, without uh, any further ado here, I'd like to open up for questions. Um, feel free to direct them to myself or Martin, as well as our two speakers, and we will get through as many as we can here. And I suppose I can kick off here uh, with one that was submitted a bit earlier. Uh, what is the best practice to make sure that people are patient throughout the wait and don't leave the queue? So I would uh, you know, definitely uh, call this question back to the administration section of the presentation, uh, stressing uh, beyond belief the importance of communication. So um, you know, users who are frustrated and feel that you know, maybe they're not waiting for a purpose or they don't know how long they'll be waiting, things like that. It's those types of thoughts that lead a customer to abandon the queue. So the more uh, engaged you keep them through uh, you know, adding widgets, videos, things like that, uh, that's very important. And you know, making sure they know exactly what the end game is with regards to their wait time, uh, as much info as you're able to provide there uh, it's definitely uh, positively correlated with the amount of time that they'll wait, uh, you know, according to Q psychology and all that. Um, I'll just jump in. This is Alex um, on that point as well. As I mentioned, you know, we have gone through several iterations of our communications over the past couple of years. Um, one of the things that stood out to us was, you know, of course, just kind of reassuring everyone. Um, but the, the wait times can fluctuate, of course, depending on how fast you're letting people through the queue, um, how many people are joining the queue, all that good stuff. So one thing that we did find helpful to mention is, is just kind of noting every element of that customer experience. So your wait time might fluctuate, that's normal. Um, you might not end up waiting as long as it originally says, which nine times out of 10 is the case, because again, we're letting people out more, more and more quickly. So I think kind of establishing what's normal, since obviously, you know, a waiting room for different websites can vary. Um, so just letting them know you're in the right place, just be patient, things will move more quickly. Um, just kind of reassuring them that they're gonna get to where they need to go. Um, and it might take a few different iterations, you know, our first event versus our third event obviously had a bunch of changes, but um, ultimately I think it's just informing them that they don't need to be doing anything at this time. No action is required. Um, and like Gary mentioned, you know, just keeping them engaged as well. Yeah, 
on the Kuka side, we also have like a way to keep people in the queue is that live chat uh, feature that you're offering. It's a way for us to keep engaging with the user, to keep pushing for the brand and to be able not only to reassure people, but also to provide some fun and some distraction while the people wait. I mean, nobody likes to wait. It's usually very frustrating for them. In our use case, they don't want the queue, they want more stock. So for us, being able to send messages to our users and be able to engage in them in multiple languages at the same time is really, really critical. Great. Um, and uh, Alex and Pierre, I'm thinking um, um, we, we often hear that uh, our clients don't like to show how many users are in the queue or how many users are in front of the people in the queue. Um, what is your take on that? Uh, is that something where you say, okay, it's, it's important for us not to show it? Or is it something where you say, okay, it's, it's actually nice to show that we have a lot of users? I can answer that on my side. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the cooker side, we are we trying to keep the information on how many people have bought the offer and how much stock we have as secret as possible. So for us, it's a big no-no to uh, display how many users are in the queue. We know it internally, uh, but uh, this is not something we are, we are uh, publishing. Same on our end with that. That was actually a preference for from the influencers. Um, I don't know, I think it might, they might expect that it generates a little bit more stress. And again, a lot of this is coming from feedback on social, um, th through our support, um, some of the questions that we've gotten. So we did choose to hide that as you guys may have seen in our, some of our examples. Okay, um, that, that's, uh, that's, that's great to hear. It's, it's uh, something where we get, uh, you know, both sides, some say that it's, uh, it's, uh, adding to the to the hype and to the you know fear of missing out, knowing how many is in front of you, and others say this is something we keep inside. And uh, luckily, we support both uh, features. Right. Um, so I'll just jump on to the next question. Is that uh, somebody's asking here? I still have JavaScript. Uh, should I move to server side integration? And I think um, it depends. Um, and if, if you are in a situation with a flash sales, like the two examples here, or you have limited inventory or something like that, I would recommend moving to the server side. Um, also, if you experience issues with bots that are, you know, bypassing the entire website and it's just hitting directly on the add to cart um, endpoint, that's also an indication of that server side is, is a good thing to, to start looking at. Um, but it's it's not mandatory for for retail. Um, there can be you know, a lot of situations where the JavaScript is good enough, and uh, it's just taking the majority of the load away. So um, it's it's a depends, I guess, answer. Excellent, thank you, Martin. And uh, just to jump back in and kind of put a bow on uh, that discussion we had prior to that JavaScript question, uh, there was a question asked called uh, that says, uh, "What are common mistakes customers make with the queue page design and communication?" So definitely, thank you to uh, Alex and Pierre there for that clarification. Uh, definitely want to use some discretion, uh, and it's totally up to you. You know which metrics you are showing or are not showing. Obviously, had some examples there when you wouldn't want to show certain metrics. Um, so that could be a mistake there with the queue page is showing you know, too much or not enough, depending on uh, what metrics are, are really important there. And then kind of in a more broad sense, um, you know, mistakes that you would make would be just generally kind of leaving it too bare, uh, not enough clear explanation, um, you know, not enough metrics that they really don't have enough context as to where they sit, or a queue page that you know, lacks branding or uh, engagement elements, things like that. So I would say, you know, the two key areas for making sure your design is, is perfect would be, um, you know, really thinking about how and what you're communicating and then filling in that space with uh, interesting and relevant uh, widgets and things like that. So I think we just have time for, for, us, for one more uh, question here. And uh, someone is asking, you know, how long does it take 
to uh, to do a native app integration. And um, I would say, especially if you have your app developers in house or very close by, and they are working on it uh, uh, on a daily basis, more or less, then it is a very manual task, and it's like you know usually a day. Um, of course, if it's something that is more uh, rarely where you, you update the app and it's it might be outsourced, then it usually adds a, a day or two uh, or, or three, depending on, on how that is working. But it's um, the, the majority of the time is usually allocated for the uh, approval process at the app stores. Yeah, on the Coca side, we have implemented the Qit SDK on both Android and iOS apps. And it's not really the implementation that takes time, it's to make sure that we are testing it and that the processes integrate smoothly with the with the web and with the different devices on the customers. So indeed it's very easy to integrate, but uh, you have also you have to make sure that you maintain it after that. Exactly. Great point. Appreciate that very much, Pierre. And it looks like we're just about out of time here. So that uh, that wraps up today's webinar. Get the most out of Qit, best practices and inspiration for e-commerce success. We really hope that you've taken some concrete best practices away from the webinar and are leaving with some food for thought and inspiration. As you can see here, uh, this is our new uh, customer success team as of the new year here. So obviously myself, Gary Symington, I'm here managing our customers in North and South America. And my colleague in Denmark, Tatiana Trosakova, is managing the rest of the world. So I've, uh, I've met a number of you thus far. Those I haven't, I really look forward to working with you. And um, you know, feel free to reach out. I'm here to serve as a partner, keep you posted on what's going on internally, and really just help you get the most out of our solution in general. Um, that being said, it would probably still be most efficient if you have just a strictly technical question, uh, you know, how do I do this kind of question, I would uh, still go through the support channel in the Guild platform, as that sends an email directly to all of our experts who are standing by to make sure we get those issues resolved as efficiently as possible. So thank you all so much for joining us. Look forward to working with you and have a great rest of your week.